Good morning. Good morning. And a very warm welcome to worship this morning. A special welcome if you're here visiting today or if you're back after a time away. It's lovely to, to see you all here, especially on um, such a wintry morning. Uh, I hope you'll join us for tea and coffee after the service. Um, head out down the centre aisle. If you want tea or coffee, you turn left or right at the back and your coffee or tea and milk will be served to you. Um, you take your mug and go and sit at one of the tables and you can take your mask off to eat and drink. Um, please feel free to join us and we'll uh, get a chance to catch up. It's really good to be back again this week and I want to thank you all for all your cards and good wishes and uh, offers of help and everything over the last two weeks. I've really appreciated it. I've been overwhelmed by your kindness. So thank you so much uh, for all the care that you've shown to me when I wasn't well. Um, it really has been um, encouraging to see how much the community has rallied around. Thank you. Right, so what intimations do we have this morning? Cafe Church on Wednesday. We're still hoping to go ahead with that. We'll be spread out a bit. Um, I'll be showing you how to make some easy Christmas decorations, and they are easy, no skill required. Um, and at the end, we'll serve some tea and coffee. Cargill Trio this coming Saturday at 3 o'clock. Uh, you need to book your tickets online, but you pay on the day. Mission Christmas Cash for Kids, so this is for next Sunday. If you are able to buy some toys, gifts for children, specifically from 9 up to 18, babies and children, but also younger children as well. They, they give you ideas there, and we realise you probably can't read that, but that's all on the website, so you can go and have a look, and it's just ideas of what might be suitable if you're thinking, I haven't a clue what to buy a child. So if you can bring those unwrapped next Sunday, there is a good chance that our gate will be out of commission next Sunday, the main drive-in gate, because it's going, there's go, the, the dip underneath it's going to be fixed by the council. So they've said that they hope to do it this week, weather permitting. So normally next week we would have uh, Susan here for Instant Neighbour, and you'd put all the stuff for Instant Neighbour into her car. Next week Susan will be here for Instant Neighbour, and Jim and Ruby will be here for Mission, cash for, Mission Christmas Cash for Kids. If the gate's out of commission, they'll be on the road outside. So look for uh, cars with their boots open and people standing freezing next to them and you can work out which car your stuff's to go into. So if we can't get inside using the main gates next week, it might need to be on the road and we might all need to use the side gate. But if they're offering to fix it for us, we thought we'd let them. <laughs> so, And then next Sunday, there will not be tea and coffee after the service but there will be communion if you wish to stay for it. Absolutely up to you, but what we'll do is after the benediction, if you are happy to stay for communion, you simply stay in your seat while everybody else goes and the elements will be delivered to you where you are. Okay. And next Sunday afternoon is our memorial service. So three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, for anybody who's feeling sad at Christmas or who's lost someone and is missing them at Christmas. Um, we have sent invitations to those for families who have done a funeral for a family member in the last couple of years, but everybody is welcome. And I would also like to encourage some of the elders to be here if they can, just in case people need somebody to talk to afterwards, because it can be an emotional time. So tea and coffee will be served after that service next week, but it'll be communion with no tea and coffee after the morning service. Okay, keeping up with all this, I'm not sure I am. <laughs> Kirk Session meeting Tuesday the 7th of December at 7 p.m. You should all have received an email about that as well, or everybody who's on the session. And Saturday the 11th of December at 7.30, we've got the Aberdeen Chamber Orchestra concert. So that's one, if you want tickets, you go on to the Aberdeen Chamber Orchestra uh, website and book it. You need to pay online for that one, but if anyone has a problem doing an online payment, get in touch, we can, we can organise that for you. And then on the Sunday evening, we've got Christmas concert and carol sing along with the Bon Accord Silver Band, Sunday the 12th. Uh, again, go on to their website to book tickets. There's lots going on. <laughs> 
and that's even before we start to tell you about the Maggie's concert, which is the following week. Um, it's great that there is so much happening. We, all of these uh, organisations have agreed to st stick with our um, one metre distancing. They're all working on that principle, so we will, it would be the same as church on a Sunday, that there would be distancing between people as they come. Um, bon Accord is doing catering, they're doing mulled wine and mince pies, but again, they've done a risk assessment and it should all be covered. So all of these events, as far as it's within our control, are COVID safe, if you're concerned about that. Um, but we're delighted that we're able to start having musical events in the church again. Now, music at Woodstock, it's managed one concert so far. We've, we've had to change a few, but let's hope we can start getting a few more events and keep people, keep people's Christmas cheer up. Right, so you'll notice I'm in purple today. I almost put my green scarf on and remember just in time that today's a purple day because it's the first Sunday of Advent, so we have our Advent wreath. Thanks, Marjorie. And we're going to take a moment today to think about what Advent means. Several people are helping me through the service, so thank you to them. Um, I've arranged this so that I sit down through a big chunk of this and don't get exhausted, but um, people have been very generous in helping. And thank you so much to Shona and Pam and Alison for last week for stepping in at really quite short notice. <laughs> Um, really appreciate that. So let's take a moment to take a deep breath and still ourselves and prepare to worship. Today marks the first Sunday of Advent, a Sunday of hope. Hope born into our world 2,000 years ago Hope born again this time of year. Hope born with the sound of every new cry as a babe is born. Yet sometimes hope seems far away. Far away from our homes, our churches, our communities, our world. So today we pray that hope will be reborn in all places of conflict, that the light of hope will shine bright and be born in us this morning. So let's worship our God three in one, one in three as we sing our first hymn. It's called The Advent Journey. It's been written by Tom Gordon. The tune should be familiar to you. We did sing this two years ago, but if you can remember, you're doing better than I am. Um, so a hymn about the Advent Journey and you should recognise the tune. We stand to sing, but keep our masks on.
The first candle to be lit on our Advent wreath is the candle of hope. The materials I am reading from this morning were written by Sally Foster Fulton and can be found in her book, Hope Was Heard Singing. At the advent of Advent, it's worth remembering who we are waiting for. Not a child in a major, all swaddling clothes and innocence, but a man on a mission with an uncompromising agenda. One that gives the whole world to the meek. One that asks us to give up all that the world tells us is important. One that says that true power can be found housed in the frailty of forgiveness. The virtue of vulnerability that says that there is freedom in saddling ourselves to the needs of others. We are waiting for a rebel. So get ready. Because if you acknowledge his birth, if you are on your guard, if you lay a stake in his claim that God can burst through and change the world, then he'll have no choice but to begin that change in you. Remember who we're waiting for. Guide our waiting. Let us pray. What do we long for, God? So many things. Love, life, but also more money, more friends, more credit, more acclaim. We do it. It may not be politically correct to admit it or be something we would ever want to say out loud, especially within these confines. But you know it, and we know it. Be with us, God, in this time of waiting and watching. Wrestle in us. Stretch our searching souls so that we see our wants more clearly. Help us to untie the knots we get ourselves into by desiring what cannot complete us. Guide our longing souls back to you. What do we long for, God? So many things. A magic wand or a fairy godmother, someone else to take over for a while. We want to wake up and for everything to be magically better somehow. Voila. We do. We know it's not probable. We know it's not possible. But we wish it all the same. God be with us in this time of waiting and watching. Remind us of the things we already know that we're all in this together, and that's a pretty good place to be, that prayers are empty unless we're willing to do some work after the amen, that beginnings and first steps are necessary and not naive. Your goodness surrounds us. May we long for more sightings of that. God who comes to us in a baby's cry, in a lover's touch, in the voice of a friend, sometimes in a desperate face. Enter our yearning spirit, and in our waiting, guide our longing. This we pray in Jesus' name, and in his name, I invite you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We shall now sing hymn 716, Come and find the quiet center.
our reading this morning will be read for us by Christine Patterson. The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 8 to 25. When he was serving as a priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zachariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people to Israel, to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zachariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he couldn't speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five, mo- five months she may- remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the di- disgrace I have endured among my people. Thanks to be to God for this reading. This Advent we will be looking a little more closely at the encounters with angels in the Gospel stories. And there are a lot of perceptions about angels. Children, in particular, have some interesting ideas about angels. I thought I'd share with you some of the quotes that children have said about angels. So Gregory, aged five, says, I only know the name of two angels, Hawk and Harold. Jack, six, says that angels don't eat, but they drink milk from holy cows. And Matthew 9 says, it's not easy to become an angel. First you die, then you go to heaven, then there's still the flight training to go through, and then you've got to agree to wear those angel clothes. Mitchell, who's seven, says, angels work for God, and they watch over kids when God has to do something else. Daniel 9 says that angels talk all the way while they're flying you to heaven. The main subject is where you went wrong before you got dead. Angels live in cloud houses made by God and his son, who's a very good carpenter, says Jared. Caitlin Nine says, my angel is my grandma who died last year. She got a big head start on helping me while she was still here on earth. Vicky Eight says, some of the angels are in charge of helping heal sick animals and pets. And if they don't make the animals get better, then they help the children get over it. And Sarah Seven says, what I don't get about angels is why when someone's in love, they shoot arrows at them. I think one of the reasons that children have confused idea about angels is because adults do too. We don't really understand exactly what an angel is or how they're helping us. Sometimes it's difficult to separate fact and popular images of angels. 
So here are a few facts. Angels appear throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, with 300 allusions to them in the Old and New Testament. The word angel comes from the Greek for messenger, so it describes a function rather than the nature. In the New Testament, angels appear both at the beginning and end of Jesus' life and ministry. The angels come to him after his temptation in the desert. They come and tend to him. And when he's on the cross, there is an angel there with him too. The New Testament clearly teaches that angels watch over God's people. And what is less clear is whether each believer has an individual personal guardian angel. But that is hinted at in Matthew chapter 18 and Acts chapter 12. And only two angels are named in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. Lots of references to angels, but we're not always told who they are. So the angel who appears to Zechariah identifies himself as Gabriel. He comes with a message, you're going to have a child, and an instruction. You're going to name him John. Traditionally in Advent, we spend time focusing on John the Baptist, how he came to prepare the way for Jesus. But before John the Baptist came to prepare the way for him, first John's parents had to prepare the way for John. As an elderly couple, they've given up on children, so can you imagine Zechariah's surprise when the angel brings his message? And his fear. We're told Zechariah was startled, fear overcame him. But he pulled himself together enough to ask the angel for some confirmation. You're telling me all this, but how can I be sure of it? So the angel takes away his power of speech. We don't usually think of angels as a bit petulant, do we? That's what it seems like. Oh, you're questioning me. Well, look what I can do. Then he has to wait for the angel's words to be proved right. So we can assume he was struck dumb for nine months, but actually it could have been longer. We don't know how soon after that Elizabeth got pregnant. It was at least nine months, probably longer. And he had to wait. And when the child was born, he had to go against convention that would have named the boy after his father. And instead, he followed the angel's instructions and wrote, the boy is to be called John. But that must have been quite a long wait. And none of us really like to wait, do we? We get a bit impatient. You only have to look at any queue these days and watch everybody pull out their iPhones and the tablets and do something while they're waiting. Nobody just waits. Sit in a doctor's waiting room, there's magazines. Anywhere you are, mind you, most COVID there probably aren't, you have to bring your own. But there's always something, we want to do something while we wait. It's, waiting is a lost art. That longing, that sense of being filled with intent or dreaming into the future and wonder that is waiting's bedfellow. We've lost that art of waiting imagining that it's empty time. We need to fill it with something to keep us occupied, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, pulling out iPhones, getting restless, angry, how long is it gonna be, how long has it been, how long do we need to wait, what hasn't happened yet? But waiting, especially during Advent, is an art form, a faith form. It's a deeply spiritual time, a time when we can experience hope. Today, Pam lit for us the candle of hope. And hope is something that cannot be experienced if we don't have to wait. Waiting is inherent in hope. Hope is a reimagining of a vision, a vision of how God is shaping our lives and owning that vision and making it part of what we live for and shaping our lives around that hope, that longing, that restlessness. Because waiting frames us and shapes us. And when we take it into ourselves, we define who we are through what is yet to be. These words really resonated with me. I don't know who wrote them. There are monsters out there, but there are also angels. They come in all shapes and sizes, and sometimes we get to be an angel, and sometimes we get to help an angel. 
And sometimes we need to look a little harder beyond the caricature of winged ethereal creatures, beyond the stereotype, to the messengers of hope, to the bringers of vision. We need to look to the future and wait for what God has in store. We all have the now. Everyone can have now. Only a few dare to wait in hope for the then and those who do tend to be the ones who can believe. So let us believe. Let us believe in the angel messengers from on high and the messengers they bring. Let us believe with the faith of Zechariah and Elizabeth that even the unlikely is possible. Let us believe in the Son of God coming to earth as an infant, dependent on his human family. In God's name. Amen. This prayer was written by the late David Ogston. Some from Rutherford may remember him as a student assistant with Reverend Samuel Ballantyne in the 1960s. He went on, of course, to be an assistant at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. Then he had a charge in Balerno before moving to Perth, where he spent the remainder of his ministry. Advent intercessions, seeking blessings. Let us ask for Advent blessings, a blessing on those who wait for the star to shine. Let them not wait in vain, Lord. 
a blessing on those who have never lost the faith in the promises. Let them not be disappointed, Lord. A blessing on those who have lost their way. Let them be pointed home again, Lord. A blessing of those who have urgent prayers to say and big decisions to make. May they be answered, Lord. A blessing those who have reached the end of their tether. May they find the way beyond, Lord. A blessing on those who have tasted defeat. May they trust you, Lord, to lead them on. A blessing on those who have known in the past the holy name of Jesus, but have now lost the sight of his dear, familiar face. May they know him again, Lord, and bring him back into their lives. A blessing on those who don't believe that a king can reign from a cradle. For them that are, that a king may reign from a cradle, for them and for us we pray. That the one who is coming may lead us by gentle ways to be wise like the shepherds who knew how to kneel, and humble as kings who knew how to find the one who was greater than them. A blessing on all little children and all who are about to be born. Give us the will, Lord, to do as what has to be done to make sure that their world can be safer and brighter and fairer to all, and blessed by the King who comes. May God add his blessing to this reading. Let's sing our final hymn. It's number 316, Love Came Down at Christmas. May hope be reborn in you today. May hope be reborn in the world tomorrow. May hope be reborn so heaven may be glimpsed even here on earth. Go with the hope of God born into this world of sorrow and conflict. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those whom you love near and far away, now and always. Mm -hmm.